Eric, help me, help me overlay the linvatinib story now. So we know the serafinib story. It's been around for a long time. We've used it. Um, tell me about the linvatinib trial, because it's now FDA approved too. Give me, give me the same sort of high level view of that as Marsha did for the serafinib trial. Yeah. I mean, linvatinib was a, a little bit different in the sense that serafinib was already FDA approved when we were already looking at this in thyroid cancer. It was you know, an FDA approved drug for uh, kidney cancer. Levatinib um, did not get its approval until thyroid cancer. You know, a lot of it was based on the phase two data. You know, this was a, a drug that, um, while it was another VEGF TKI, like a thousand of them out there, it, it hit other targets, um, especially FGF, which other, the other drugs did not do, or most of them did not do as well. And it was an extremely good at, at inhibiting VEGF, um, probably better than most other ones out there as well. And when they did the phase two study, they had amazingly high response rates. And not only did they have amazingly high response rates in patients who were never treated before, they actually had extremely high response rates, about 45% in the group of patients who had prior VEGF TKIs in the past. So this was a group that, all were, that looked extremely good fresh from the phase two. Now, when you went to the phase three um, study, they also allowed a crossover. And it was not the story of serafinib where a lot of people were be able to get serafinib off study, but at the same time, they allowed that crossover. And in some ways, that does dilute the overall survival benefit that you might like to see um, overall. Um, in this group of patients, the placebo group did, did worse than you saw with the decision study. Um, there are various explanations about why that might be the case. My feeling still has always been is that people got a lot more used to do, using serafinib and using other drugs, and I think people were a little bit more selective in the patients that they put in. So I would be surprised if they had as many of those one, one centimeter um, nodules in that study as you might have, no, I don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. But well, it, it was resist 1.1, 1 .1, so 1.0 right. lesions yeah. weren't, they were they required. So that had to be the minimum. Right. Uh, Marcia, the, the survival benefit from the lumbatinib, what's, what's the story with that now? Um, well, why not, you, did you want to say a little bit more about the study design, oh, and then sorry. I'd be happy to add in the overall survival analysis. So I mean, so it was a, it was a randomized, uh, and it beat a randomized study, and but it allowed just not first-line patients, but also patients who had prior, um, already um, yeah. progressed on prior uh, VEGF TKI. So so they had two group of patients that they were looking at. And while they did combine everything together, they also showed that in both groups that there's going to be a benefit. The primary outcome because of the crossover was progression-free survival. So although overall survival was looked at as a secondary outcome, and I think you know it was interesting with this drug, what the end seen, at the same time, progression-free survival was the benefit. And there they, they showed that progression-free survival was significantly longer um, in the group that got the drug compared to placebo, both in the first line setting as well as in the second line setting. So this was the, f the first and right now, the only study out there that has looked at the second line group of patients in a randomized uh, placebo controlled right. phase three study. Um, so you end up seeing the benefit in both groups. Mm -hmm. In response rates, extremely high, including for patients who had a complete response, which is not something that, as far as I know, have, has really been reported in any other uh, VEGF TKI uh, study. Mm -hmm. So definitely a lot of interest, you know, and, and really amazing results in, yeah. uh, from mm -hmm. the study. Yeah. So um, when we look at overall survival, uh, in both studies, overall survival was not statistically significant, right. as expected. Um, in the um, linvatinib trial, it stratified in a pre in a prospect in a prospective way by age um, over less than or, or greater than sixty. Um, and we were looking at this data because we wanted to know that the toxicity was actually okay in the older yeah. patients. And as it turns out, it is. It's actually very, very good. But one of the things when we were doing that analysis is it didn't make any sense to do that analysis if it didn't work. So we looked at efficacy, and there's a bit of a surprise there. So it turned out, using these criteria, um, which did select for you know pretty aggressive patients, that it turns out that for the patients who were under 60, um, that there still was no overall survival detected, but as it turns out, patients over 60, there was a statistically significant improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of, I think it was around 0.6. So 
that actually is the first time in a prospective study, in a prospective analysis, that overall survival has been shown to be improved. Mm -hmm. So not to say that I, I do believe that we're improving overall survival in the other, and it's probably statistical reasons why we can't see it, not enough events in those other groups. But this was the first time that was shown. And, and that, I think, is also significant, because I think it really is saying that we're having an impact. And then you add together the response rates of 63%, and the fact that progression-free survival went from 3.6 months to 18 months, mm -hmm. or 15 months in the second line setting. You have a very active drug, but now for the first time you can add on top of that for half the patients, basically. Um, and we tried to look at all the reasons why that could be. Were they less likely to get secondary, second lines of therapy? Were they, you know, more, were they sicker? And no matter what analysis it was, if anything, it should said that the older patient should have done worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of the, so the, all the data, it's the first time that we've seen that. It's a very promising structural. And I thought the side effect profile, linvatinib, lin anything special about it? Then we've got yeah. all these ibs out there. Yeah, so, you know, the, the side effects um, that we're seeing with linvatinib are um, similar to many anti uh, Jeff therapies, but there's a couple of things that I want to point out. About 40 to 60 percent of patients are having hypertension, um, and so actually, when the drug is sent to the patient, they get a, um, a sphygmomanometer with it, so that, and, and, and with instructions to check their blood pressures because it can be quite severe. Um, but you can also see heart failure um, with or without um, the hypertension as well, and then diarrhea. We don't see as much hand foot as we do with some of the other drugs, um, but weight loss and muscle loss was quite significant. And so some of the things that Marsha had pointed out earlier is getting your patient ready, the exercise, the muscle strength, the you know improving the performance status before you start these drugs because we can really make them go downhill otherwise. And um, you know. Muscle and weight loss is actually a particular interest to me. We're doing a study looking at these patients who, you know, before they start the therapy and then on the therapy, and what sort of physical performance things can we do to improve that on therapy? And is it just from the, you know, people say, oh, it's just because they have diarrhea and decreased appetite that that's why they're losing weight. We actually think there's an independent mechanism that these drugs are causing weight loss through either the MAP kinase or, or some of the PI3 kinase pathways and some other drugs. Um, but then there's also life-threatening things. So patients who have had, you know, especially those patients who have had external beam radiotherapy before, and now you're giving them a drug like linvatinib or any of these anti-VEGF therapies are at increased risk of fistulas. And we're seeing them more and more commonly, unfortunately, especially if there's not a flap there between, you know, and, and thinner skin. So, and, and GI fistulas can be problematic. They're rare, thankfully, but they are a possibility and things we need to warn patients about and, and be thinking about in each particular patient. Do they have a history of diverticulosis? You know, are, th are these things possibilities? And then, you know, myocardial infarctions and pulmonary emboli, and is this patient at risk for that? They're not typically thinking things we think about in the patient with thyroid cancer like we do in pancreatic cancer, but they are there and now we've added another drug that can do that to them. So these are things that um, we just need to be thinking about all the time and putting the patient at the center. Yeah. And in, but in addition, that doesn't add, you know, along with the deconditioning comes the fatigue. I mm -hmm. think these oh, drugs fatigue, yeah. have profound fatigue. And so if you look at the Lamatin study, there was a, a large percentage of patients who had to have dose interruptions or, or decrease in their dosages, you know, based on the side effect profile. And I find in my own practice, fatigue is mm -hmm. really right up there, you know, in addition to these other things we worry about. So it's not uncommon that we'll give people breaks and yeah. then, you know, restart the drug with not really any effect on, you know, the outcome. So I think that's important for people to understand that that, that fatigue should not be, you know, diminished.